And so when you were talking about like rebalance and you went on your epic tweet thread, which I'll let you you hit on, is like if you're rebalancing once a year or once a quarter, um, there's a lot of luck in that because it's like almost like one off events or like over what time horizon? Yeah, so let's let's I'll I'll give a quick little recap because I know not everyone does or should follow me on Twitter. But I, I told a little story about something called the immaculate rebalance, which a lot of people aren't aware of. So but it was this thing that happened in the industry that is arguably responsible for creating a hundred billion dollar asset management firm. And that firm is research affiliates. So if you haven't heard of research affiliates, they are a incredibly large asset manager based out of Southern California. They work with the likes of PIMCO and also and Schwab, and they serve as index provider to all of these other product sponsors. And they really specialize in what they call fundamental indexing. So their founder, Rob Arnott, in the early, eh, probably around 2005, published a paper around this idea of fundamental indexing, which was to say, we're going to take the top thousand largest stocks and we are going to weight them in proportion to their fundamentals. So uh, their book value relative to the total book value of the market, let's say, or their earnings relative to the total earnings of the market. And so he publishes this paper in 2005. And by the end of 2005, launched an index with FTSE and used that index as the basis for an ETF with Invesco. Now, in the original paper, they rebalanced this methodology once a year at the end of December. And so basically every December, they looked at all 1,000 stocks. They weighted them in proportion to their fundamentals, which creates a value tilt. And, and then they'd wait another year and you know they'd sit on their hands for a year. When they launched the index, for some reason, they chose the third week of March as being the rebalance date. Why? I don't know. Sort of end of quarter. That's sort of how things tend to go. There's like reconstitution dates and then rebalance dates when you look at actual index methodologies, but they chose the end of March. And so they launched this at the end of 2005, 2006, 2007, their performance is sort of in line with value. And then 2009 comes around. And for those who will recall the 2008 financial crisis, the bottom of the stock market was, I believe, March 16th, 2009. I don't know if that date is, is exact. But right around there. Uh, so basically, March was the exact bottom of the financial crisis. And if you look at their relative performance of their strategy versus the market, they then went on to outperform by like 10 percentage points, which is pretty big for an active equity strategy. And so they look like absolute heroes. They made this rebalance trade right at the bottom, right in the throes of the financial crisis. They They come out with all this outperformance and money flows, absolutely flows into research affiliates because everyone's chasing performance. Oh, they have a methodology that works, right? They bought when everyone else sold. They, they're staying tough in a crisis. A couple of years later, people are looking at this and going, you know, I wonder what would have happened had they not rebalanced in March? Because that was, that was chosen back in 2005. Like, what if they just happened to rebalance every June or they had stuck with that original December date? And so these gentlemen from Robico, uh, another very large asset management firm, published a paper and said, here's what we're going to do. We are going to replicate the exact methodology of the fundamental index because it's published and out there you can do that. All we're going to change is when that rebalance happens. So we're going to look at if they had rebalanced in December, in March, in June or September, right? And so they created four versions of the index. Again, same exact rules, rebalanced once a year, just at a different point in the year. And the idea is, even though we're using the same exact rules, if you look at the market in June, and I look at the market in September or December or March, we might have slightly different baskets of stocks we choose, even following the same rules, because it's going to be about what's the deepest value at that point in time. And what they found was that, indeed, March happened to be the exact best possible rebalance date you could have chosen coming out of 2009. And in fact, if you had rebalanced in September instead, you would have had negative alpha. So going from positive 10 percentage points of alpha to like negative 1% of alpha. 
And you have to ask the question, let's say they had rebalanced in arbitrarily in September instead of March. Would research affiliates be a $150 billion firm today? I'll Here's take luck question. every time. I'll take luck every time. Right? And so eventually, uh, Research Affiliates acknowledges this. FTSE acknowledges it. They published a paper in 2012 talking about, yes, indeed, there's a huge amount of luck based upon when we rebalance. And we're going to do this thing called staggered rebalancing, where we're going to rebalance basically four times a year with one quarter of our portfolio. So it's sort of like saying we're going to run all four of these possible variations. So a portfolio that rebalances every December. One that rebalances every March, one that rebalances every June, one that rebalances every September. And we're going to allocate our capital equally across all four. So it's sort of like a quarter of our portfolio is, is rebalancing every quarter. And in doing so, kind of dramatically reduce the impact of this potential rebalance timing line. But, but it's not like that performance ever disappeared from their track record. 2009 right. came and went, and it's permanently in their track record. And it's not like they put a little asterisk next to it saying... By the way, we got lucky. The real return should have been maybe like plus 200 basis points. No, it's just there. Yeah. But and there's... so you, the immaculate rebalance gave birth, in my opinion, to a $150 billion firm. Now, look, they do a lot of other great stuff. And Rob Arnott's a marketing genius and a, and a great salesman. And I'm sure they would have had wild success otherwise. But it's hard for me to believe that that did not pour gasoline on the fire for them. No, I mean, by the way, shout out to uh, Michael Harris of the Booty Crew. He said it was, it was March 9th was the bottom. So you're just slightly off with your March 16th guess for uh, 2000. Yeah. So I think there's so many fascinating things about this is like everybody always told me, like when I talked to other hedge fund managers about launching a hedge fund, they were like, actually, the the auspicious or serendipity of time when you launch versus your strategy and how well you do in the first two years may be what makes or breaks your fund. And like, how scary is that to think about? And especially if you're like me and you're launching a, a long volatility fund at April 17th of 2020, it's not going to be a good start. But like how many firms, like you're saying, it's like, you know, we're not, we're, we do, people don't think about that survivorship bias is like you take that return. And then like you said, then you change the strategy to maybe rebalance more frequently, or a lot of people then lower their ball and then they'll just write out that returns. And what's even worse is their Kager will look good, especially for the next three to five years, but it's really yeah. just one outlier in the Kager, right? And so that you have to really study this when you're like, when you're talking to managers, but what it made me, you know, yes, so you, you were talking about the, the depression now earlier, you, you got me into a depression thinking about how important that first year is, especially you know, our long ball in April 17th, 2020. But also, um, so what do you think about when, obviously an annual is ridiculously lucky, quarterly is pretty lucky. When we start getting into monthly, are you okay with that? Or you still need, like we talked about before, weekly or or rebalancing bands? Like at what point do you start to say, okay, it's not as lucky? So there are a couple of drivers when it comes to like how much of an impact this can have. So I, I, I sort of make a joke. I think there's only three papers in the world that have ever been written on this and I'm co-author on two of them so i Th that's awesome as i said last week i am the foremost expert um <laughs> maybe so there's i like really to say like, we're that we're the hottest show in finance with with only triple digit views that's right uh there's really three primary in, in things that impact uh rebalance timing luck uh turnover of the strategy so for example if if your strategy was to just be i don't know long the s p 500 and that was it. It's like, well, you can like, well, rebalancing there doesn't really make sense. I don't know. Long SPY and IVV, which are both S&P 500 ETFs. Like it doesn't matter your turnover so low in, in that portfolio. If you're trying to maintain a 50-50 mix, there is effectively no rebalance timing luck. If you run a momentum strategy with hundreds of percentage of turnover every year, well, what that means is the longer between you and I go between when I rebalance versus you rebalance means the basket of stocks that we own could be very different, right? A, a low turnover value strategy maybe has a little less risk than a high turnover momentum strategy. Um, but we have to recognize like turnover is not really a continuous concept. It tends to be streaky and tends to be impacted pretty heavily by market events. So you might get a lot more turnover in a period like 2008 or March 2020 than you do in sort of calmer markets. But how do you think about the number of instruments and that ratioed versus the amount of rebalancing? So it's not really about the number of instruments then. The other question then becomes, in your investable universe, 
how different can the portfolios be? So let's come up with an extreme example. Like uh, you are going to go either long the market or short the market, right? Those are the two things you can do. And so when you think about, okay, Jason's taking a tactical signal he's implementing on at the end of this month and you go long the market and I wait two weeks and then run the exact same strategy and my signals to go short the market, the dispersion between our portfolio returns is going to be massive because we're taking exact opposite bets versus if you're like, well, my portfolio is all mega cap tech and I'm, and it's just slight weighting changes and, and I'm investing from in the same universe and it's all mega cap tech. Like the two week offset doesn't really matter because the portfolios are going to be so highly correlated that we create. So there's the turnover that can be done. And then the, the sort of dis, potential dispersion in the investable universe has a huge impact. And then comes the frequency of rebalancing, right? If, if you're rebalancing daily, you and I don't have an opportunity to be different. We're both rebalancing daily. If we're rebalancing weekly, well, if you rebalance on Monday and I rebalance on Wednesday, our portfolios can sort of only be two days off. If we're rebalancing annually, well, we could choose six months apart from each other, and that could be a big difference. So the three factors, right? Frequency, internal turnover, and then the potential dispersion within the universe, and they all play an equally important role.